mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedures. So it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. 
at this point, we're about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. And hello, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 36, I believe. Is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. PerfWeb 36. It's good to see everybody. We're going to jump right. This is going to be a fun talk today. Mm -hmm. Good fun talk and a fun discussion, too. Yeah. We've got some new stuff coming out as well. So let me get through the housekeeping notes because I have to do that for the, for the guys over there. Sponsors, make sure you click them, thank them, take a look at what they've got. Um, wonderful people have been tremendously influential in helping us bring this programming to you, so we appreciate them very much. Social media, make sure you like us, follow us, share us on the Facebook, the Twitter, the LinkedIn, and the YouTube. Give us the thumbs up, subscribe please, hit the notifications button, but you have to subscribe. We are so close, again, I can't believe how it's constantly going. We're number two right now in YouTube. We're number one on Facebook and Twitter, but I want to be number one on YouTube as well. I need 200 million subscribers by the end of this program, so please subscribe. Call your friends, call your family, get a Gmail account, subscribe. Thank you very much. I'm really counting on you for this. Um, check out our websites if you'd like to join our faculty, if you'd like to give a lecture, if you'd like to be part of the discussion, if you'd like to uh, maybe send a suggestion on some topics you would like to hear from or even recommend somebody else. Um, do we have it up there? Oh, there it is. Send us an email at contact at perfusioneducation.com. Uh, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Have them, have them give us a call. So we're always looking for new faculty. We've got some new stuff coming up through the rest of the year. The website needs some revision on it. Uh, but that's going to be done before the end of the weekend, so some exciting stuff. I'll talk to you more about it a little later. Uh, call in number when you see this symbol. You know that the phone lines are open. You can call that, be live on the air. We can hear you, you can hear us, everybody else can hear the discussion as well. So if you have some thoughts, some comments, some questions, please call in. Or some compliments. Don't call in if you got any complaints. Um, I think that's it. We're not doing a poll today, so I'd like to introduce, of course, our esteemed regular faculty, Terry Paris, uh, Terry Parasino, <laughs> Terry Parasino, yeah, Tammy Parasino. I can't even say it now. I can't even say it. Have I ever been on the show? Introduce yourself, will you please? Hi, I'm Tammy Parasino. Yeah, there you go. There we go. There you go. That was good. Okay. Woo. Okay, it's going to be a hell of a day. Oh. Um, Tammy Sparacino, perfusionist extraordinaire, Texas Heart Institute graduate. She's been on the program many, many, many times, and her insights, her thoughtfulness, 
Her perspectives are always so well thought out. A lot of experience come, uh, you know, that's behind all of these thoughts. And you're going to be doing some exciting stuff mm -hmm. coming up. If you want to talk about it a little bit. We're going to start a new series and we're hoping it's going to be well received of Journal Club. Yes. We're Tammy gonna... Sparacino's Journal Club. Yeah. We're going to and... do it twice mm -hmm. monthly and have some interesting topics and I would certainly welcome any topics that anyone has an interest in and it's gonna be fun. And this is gonna be sort of out of the box stuff. It's mm -hmm. not gonna be your typical everyday usual right. you know thing that we recycle over and over. We're really looking at some innovative We're I think. We're looking at unique topics but ones that are still very applicable applicable yeah see what, I can say what's that. going on mm -hmm. anyway to our practice and um, ways that we can learn and improve yes absolutely because you know later on we're gonna be actually oops I dropped my mic um, later on we're gonna be discussing um, uh, uh, the scope of practice as a matter of fact and I've got some real thoughts about that it's interesting what's published but what you know, sort of in my mind and maybe your mind also. So let me get this lecture done. Mm -hmm. um, that way we can have this talk. I really enjoyed putting this together and I recently gave this lecture actually at the Texas Heart Institute's 2020 uh, Perfusion Conference, mm -hmm. which was so much fun. They did such a fantastic job. They had to basically, they had to do it all online. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was rough. They had like three weeks to prepare. Um, and I think that uh, I think that uh, uh, Deb Adams, you know, I think that uh, Kathy, I can't remember Kathy's last name, of course, Ann Grecho, mm -hmm. um, all of those they guys, do a Carrie. Very nice job there. Um, I don't remember everybody's name there. Please forgive me, but they just did an exceptional job mm -hmm. in ver with very short notice to take that whole conference that they had been planning all year and do it online mm -hmm. um, and it was very well received and it was a lot of fun but I did this talk for them and I wanted to do it for our own audience as mm -hmm. well because I really kind of I really enjoyed putting this together so let's go ahead straight to my slides so the title of my presentation is looking in others toolboxes and uh, I actually got this idea from two folks who I have tremendous amount of respect for uh, there's Alan Lumsden, who happens to be the, he's the cha actually the chairman of cardiovascular surgery at the Bakey Heart and Vascular at Methodist, but he is the director of Pumps and Pipes. And Steve Igo, who is the executive director uh, of Pumps and Pipes. And these two guys have allowed me to use some of their slides. Some of them I got elsewhere, but some of their slides. And to sort of explain to you a little bit about their concept. First of all, I think they have one of the most intriguing um, icons or logos that I have ever seen. Uh, and Pumps and Pipes is basically a collaborative meeting that involves cardiovascular medicine, energy and or oil and gas and aerospace. So all of these three industries are filled with pumps and pipes and their mission is to educate communicate collaborate and innovate and they're in multiple countries i think they're in like 23 countries you can find them online uh, at pumpsandpipes.com they have an annual meeting uh, they have a website and be frank with you i think they're they're i think that they are one of the most intriguing and interesting non-perfusion but germane to perfusion conferences that uh, I've ever attended. So I highly recommend them. And I want to thank these two guys for allowing me to use some of their slides. I also need to thank, uh, let's see. Ah, there we go. I also need to thank these two wonderful people. Terry Crane, recently retired director of the Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion and Deborah Lowry Adams, who has supplanted him in the role as director of uh, the uh, THI uh, School of Perfusion and who is doing an exceptional job. Uh, Terry, uh, I believe, at least I've heard, is enjoying his retirement, uh, but he's still very, very involved, which we, I think we appreciate tremendously. And Deborah has been, you know, of course, Deborah Adams is an icon of perfusion, been around so long and is such a, I mean, she looks so young to have been around as long as she has. 
but she's so creative, so innovative, so thoughtful, and has done so much for the perfusion profession. I can't say enough positive about her, and I don't think they could have found anyone to fill Terry's shoes better than her. I think she was really the best choice for the job, certainly. So congratulations to both of them. And thank you also for helping me with some of these slides and some of the historical perspectives that I needed to put this together. So moving on, if you take a look at this slide, this is Dr. Dodrell. Let me see if I can get the mouse to work. Well, I'll just say it. I can't see it. In the upper left-hand corner is Dr. Dodrell. And what you're seeing there is a heart pump, not a heart-lung machine, but a heart pump. Now you see there's two guys tinkering with it. And the guy on the right, on the fo in the foreground looking down, yep, that guy right there is, nope, nope, the other guy with the glasses, hmm. there he is, is Calvin Hughes. Now arguably, Calvin Hughes, now this predates Dr. Gibbons' heart-lung machine, the, 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 the one that I'll show you next. This predates him. And so Calvin Hughes is, was, a, was a GM engineer, General Motors, and arguably he was the first perfusionist because he ran this thing on a patient, on patients, and I think, you know, might qualify him. Well, he went to medical school, and everyone thought that he was, you know, going to go to medical school and be a cardiac surgeon or a thoracic surgeon. He became a psychiatrist. And so I think that says something about what perfusion does to us. So with that said, if you look at the machine and you look at a General Motors straight six engine, you see the influence General Motors had on the way this thing was built. And here it is actually running on a patient. You'll get to see that. And there it goes. You can see the blood in it. But you can see the concept of the pistons and the cylinders and the pressures and just sort of the way the whole thing is operating. It just so much looks like a car motor. And it really, you can sense the influence. So moving on to the IBM Gibbons II, which is what's pictured on the left. This came from Bill Stoney's book. And that heart-lung machine that you see there is in the uh, museum at Thomas Jefferson University where it was first used on Cecilia uh, Bavillac, Cecilia Bavillac in 1953 for closure of an ASD. But if you look in the upper right hand corner, you see an IBM punch card business machine. Again, you see the influence of how IBM decided this machine, what it needed to look like. And then in the bottom right hand picture, of course, you see Mary Gibbon operating that very pump for her husband, John Gibbon, during an operation at Thomas Jefferson University. You know, he only did four. Mm -hmm. The first one he did died. Mm -hmm. The second one that he did was Cecilia uh, uh, Bavilek. She survived. Mm -hmm. The third one died, the fourth, fourth one, one died. died, and he quit. He yeah. never did another case with the heart-lung machine. He turned it over to his colleagues. Uh, so he did a lifetime of work, but uh, for the one success, but of course that marked a tremendous time in history for us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be done. So moving along a little, just a few years, and we see here Dr. Richard DeWall tinkering with his DeWall bubble oxygenator, which ultimately ended up being marketed. It cost $15 and it was uh, simple to use, very easy to use, as you see there with uh, Dr. DeWall with his, with his model. Now, about this time, you know, he's trying to figure this out. He's got the bubble oxygen. I don't know how he figured this out. I don't know what, what he knew or how he knew about this product. But what was one of the big issues with bubble oxygenators? Well, bubbling the blood definitely transfers oxygen, but it causes Air. foam. Yeah. Foam is bad yeah. in the arterial system, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's interesting that Dr. DeWall did a lot of his, 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 his foundation for developing the bubble oxygenator came from the 1800s when they were bubbling air into veins to oxygenate. Now it didn't work out well, hmm. but this work had, people knew already 
even in the 1800s, that you could oxygenate blood by bubbling air into it. The problem again, though, is the foam doesn't work out too terribly well. So he used this substance. Now, how he knew about this substance is still uh, not understood quite by me, but it's Dow Corning Anti-Foam A. And if you, there's the product literature, that's an actual can of it. And I'll show you here one of the things. Now, this product, let me just go back just for a second if I could. Oops, I'm sorry. I went a little too far. Let me see here. Yeah. So this product is good for uh, paper and textiles, distillation systems, asphalt manufacturing, lubricating oils, and detergents. It is a foam killer. That's what they call it, okay? okay. So moving on from there, it also says this. This product is neither tested nor represented as suitable for medical or pharmaceutical uses. This product is not intended for use in food processing. So it's interesting that he realized this product existed. They used it for his bubble oxygenator. And if we look at this letter here that was written by Dr. Lily High, who Dr. DeWall worked for in his lab um, at the time, to the president of Dow Corning explaining that they have used this on animals and also humans, but in the animals they have used much more of it than they actually would have needed and have not really seen any toxicity. But what exactly is in it? And do you know of anything about it that might be toxic? And this letter is what that says to the president of Dow Corning. Now, the letter back from Dow Corning, I am pretty sure is not directly answering that question, though it, the time frame is similar enough that it makes you wonder. And he's congratulating Dr. Lily High on their progress and that um, he's really happy that their Dow Corning Anti-Foam A is working out so well. And oh, by the way, we've got some new stuff out there tubing and things so that may be beneficial uh, and less traumatic to the blood. So what's interesting about this is that you have General Motors, you have IBM, mm -hmm. now you have Dow Corning. None of them have anything to do really with medicine at all, mm -hmm. but here they are in, in, in as pivotal members, collaborators, in what is the basically birth time, the, the, the birth event of modern cardiac surgery. And I think that's very important because the whole title of this talk is collaboration in cross industry collaboration. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk more about that. But anyway, these are two very interesting letters. I recommend that you read them. They're interesting historical uh, uh, perspectives, I believe. Now, about this time, the only two places in the, really in the country, but I mean really the world, that were doing cardiac surgery was Mayo Clinic, or were Mayo Clinic, and the University of Minnesota. Well, they were allowing for surgeons from all over the world to come there and see what they were doing to mm -hmm. learn from them. Now, up at the University of uh, up at Mayo was uh, Dr. Kirkland, and he was using the IBM Gibbon II. And then at the University of Minnesota, they were using, that was Dr. Lilyhigh, they were using cross circulation. Mm -hmm. Well, they were inviting people to come up so that they could see these procedures and learn and talk to them and so forth and so on. And who actually goes but a young Dr. Cooley. Now, there's the young Dr. Cooley all the way on the left, and then obviously the evolution of him through his life. We all know what Dr. Cooley accomplished here at the Texas Heart Institute. Um, just an incredible career, incredible man. But he goes there and he actually sees the Dr. Kirkland do, do a case with the IBM Gibbon II machine. Um, and he goes and he sees a cross-circulation procedure with Dr. Lilyhigh. 
And he thought to himself, you know, man, that Gibbon too, that's a, that's a big complicated machine. You know, Dr. Cooley was very into simplification, simplification. right? Keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. Um, how does that go? It's simplify. There, uh, he had a phrase that he used oh, to use. No. I don't want to butcher it, but he had a very interesting phrase. Mm -hmm. but, but to make a long story short, while they were there, they didn't get to see it used, but Dr. Cooley saw the DeWall bubble oxygenator. Mm. And Dr. Cooley brought one back mm. to Houston. Dr. Cooley used it at the Texas Heart Institute, actually used the DeWall bubble oxygenator. But he thought about it and he looked at this thing and there was something Dr. Cooley really liked besides cardiac surgery, besides taking care of his patients, besides his patients, besides just people in general. Dr. Cooley was one of the most, one of the most, one of the kindest people I think ever that you'll ever find that was in a position that he was in certainly, but he loved coffee. He always had coffee. He loved mm -hmm. coffee. Well, he thought to himself, you know, how do you make coffee? And in those days, how you made coffee was you used a percolator. Mm -hmm. There were no such thing as these other things. There were percolators, mm -hmm. right? And he's like, well, wouldn't that work the same? So he goes down to the restaurant supply store and he buys himself a big coffee pot. And there it is. And he patents it. It is the Baylor bubble oxygenator. It's the Cooley coffee pot oxygenator, if you will. There is uh, in the center, at, well, the, for the left, of course, you see a picture of the actual device. Mm -hmm. In the center, the smaller picture you see is the European patent diagram. And then on the right is the United States patent for this. It was produced, it was marketed, it was sold as the Cooley coffee pot or Baylor bubble oxygenator. And here is Mary Martin actually using the device. Now, if I can get the mouse to work, I can. Here's Mary Martin, obviously. Here's the pump, patient's over there. And here is the coffee pot oxygenator right here. And that's basically what it is. It's just a big restaurant coffee pot that was modified internally. And it has, of course, sponges, stainless steel sponges coated with Dow Corning Anti-Foam A. And Mary Martin wrote a note. That's a very important photograph, I think, for us in the, uh, in the uh, perfusion business. Now, another very good example of cross-industry uh, collaboration is the Greenfield filter. So Dr. Greenfield had a patient, had a massive pulmonary embolus. He put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass and he tried digging out all the clot that he possibly could but there was so much clot burden in the lungs, um, just impossible to get it all out. The patient did, of course, bleed as one would expect. They were probably on pump for a very long time. And in 1973, you know, the pumps were, you know, they were using the bubble oxygenators, okay? Um, so he had a bad outcome. Patient died. Uh, well, he went home and he was talking to his neighbor. His neighbor was an oil industry engineer named Garmin Kimmel. And he thought about it and he said, well, why don't you just make a filter and put it in the venous system so it'll trap the blood, the clot, before it reaches the lungs. Well, then comes along this guy. This is John Abley. He is the co-founder of Boston Scientific. Mm. And he is the person that they then went to to help bring this product to not just from the developmental phase and the, or the concept and developmental phase, but then also the production and distribution phase. Mm -hmm. And he said something that was very important and it's down at the bottom in red. You look at the problem and then you try to connect it to other areas which may have nothing to do with the problem you're working on. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important concept because sometimes we have something that is a solution to what we are trying to do, but those people over there could really use this for their problem over there. And, but this is a perfect example, the trilogy, if you will, of cross-industry collaboration between a heart surgeon who identified there was a problem and was able with the right tool or product to help 
patience with that problem. An engineer who had the mind to understand flow characteristics in the, in, in, in the Venus system and laminar flow and all of the things that you need to, to make a device that would not obstruct flow but would stop clot. And then of course the industry person to be able to take that mm -hmm. and get it built and distributed so that it could be used on a wide scale for patients the world over. So that's the story of the Greenfield filter. Here is another excellent example of cross-industry collaboration. On the left, you see a NASA, NASA astronaut in the zero buoyancy tank uh, at NASA. They're the only ones that have such a thing. And on the right, you see a deep sea diver welder who is learning how to perform their multiple tasks in a deep sea, neutral, neutrally buoyant environment. Here is a great example of a robot running, operating a robot. So that's Robonaut. I can tell you a little bit more about Robonaut going forward. And this is a very, another beautiful example of, uh, of cross industry collaboration. So this is the story of Luca Parmentano. He's an Italian astronaut. I listened to his lecture and his lecture was gripping. So he's out in space doing a spacewalk when he starts to feel something wet and he should not be feeling something wet. Now he's, out in, he's outside the space station in space, very hostile environment. And he's not sure what it is, but after and he lets everybody know and after a little while, his communications start to get a little bit disrupted. Hmm and he starts to see water in front of his face shield. Oh. So in zero gravity, water doesn't behave like it does. You can't just make it move and he can't open his face shield and wipe it away. And he has no idea how much water is this and what's it gonna do? Because if the water gets in his mouth and his nose, he's not going to be able to breathe. So he now has to, with an obscured face shield, make his way back to the hatch to get back into the space station with no one able to help him. And it's only through his training that he remembered all of the steps where he was and what, it, what he had to do to get to the hatch. They got him in the hatch, they opened it up, you know, the, the airlock and they got the suit off. And of course he was fine because here he is giving this lecture. But what they did was they took the suit, NASA did, to Methodist to their imaging center because they've got incredible imaging, okay, at Houston Methodist, I, don't, I mean the best in the world really. And they imaged the suit and they found that it had an infection in the thermal regulatory device, which is basically run by water. Now, you know, remember Dr. Macris, he uses a similar suit that has water that circulates oh. to keep him yeah, cool. cool suit. That's how they do it in space. Mm. They use water going through and refrigerate it so that they can maintain or heat it and yeah. they can maintain their temperature depending on where they are in the environment. The biofilm caused the rupture of oh. one of those water lines. That's why they call it an infection because it was, it was a, a biofilm bio that destroyed the connecting point, mm -hmm. and that's what caused the leak to occur. And it resulted in them making a major change in how they design uh, 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 spacesuits and the, 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 the environmental control system, if mm -hmm. you will, of them. So that's an interesting story. But, um, but if you get a chance to listen to uh, Luca Par Parmentano's uh, The Astro Italian Astronauts Lecture. I think you might be able to find it on YouTube. I would do it because it's fascinating. Listening to it from him, it's, it, it, it will definitely make your heart stop. Mm. So here's another example where if you look here, what you see in the, this area, this is a directional drill. Okay. Now when you do a drill, drilling for oil or gas, whatever it is you're drilling for, but in this case oil, 
the drill and the, 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 the tube that takes the oil from the earth isn't a single tube. It's a tube in a tube. Mm -hmm. And it has what they call a gravel pack. So if you look here, you will see right here, you have a tube in a tube, mm -hmm. and then you see these white things. And these white things are shape charges. And what they do is they get the drill, oops, what I do? Sorry. They get the, well, okay, come on. Okay. What's happening? Somebody help me here. Uh, it's me, uh, resting my hand on it. They get the drill where they need it, the drill tip, and they blow these shape charges. And then the, whatever's in the ground, the oil plus whatever else is coming through it, come through to the center and then back up to the earth. Mm. And that's basically a filtration system. And what they don't want is turbulence. So again, they went to medicine, they went to an advanced imaging center, and they pumped very high pressure fluids at various viscosities and looked at the flows that were coming through to find areas of turbulence mm -hmm. because if you have turbulence, you get decreased flow, you get damage, you get disruption, you get foaming, you get all kinds of things happen. You don't want turbulence in the oil and gas industry. You want very clean laminar flow. And so they use medical imaging to actually be able to decide where these shape charges need to be and the size that they need to be. Now that's pretty creative stuff when you think about it, but that's how they do it. Now here is a, an example of a scientist who is using satellites to detect mosquito breeding habitats. Now here in the United States, we just see the trucks that go down the street and they just spew out all of the uh, uh, mosquito repellents and, and stuff like that. But when you start talking about big giant areas, whether it be in South America, the Amazon, or it be in Africa, um, wherever you know, it, it could be, you can't just go dump a bunch of mosquito right. eradication uh, on an entire continent or an entire country. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for them to be able to find the likely sources. And this is of course gonna reduce disease transmission tremendously in these countries. So using s science and using NASA, using satellites and, and, and also private industry satellites to be able to identify where the mosquito breeding locations are they can more specifically target mm -hmm. their eradication uh, systems. And I think that's very interesting. Now, the dog has 300 million olfactory sen uh, sensors, receptors in their nose. We have about 6 million. So we can't smell nearly as good as a dog. And who doesn't love dogs? I mean, how do you not love that nose? So we know dogs are used for sniffing out drugs. Mm -hmm. We know we can use dogs for sniffing out cadavers. We know we can help find uh, living people. Mm -hmm. We know we can, that some dogs can actually locate some cancers, right? Um, or identify somebody that has cancers. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you have an oil spill, so the oil industry is using dogs. Oh. And when there's an oil spill out in the Gulf or in the ocean and the water with the oil gets into the, to the sandy mm. uh, shorelines, it sinks immediately, you can't oh. see it. So the oil industry will hire herds of people to walk around with these sticks and they stick the stick in the ground and mm. they pull it up yeah. and they look for oil. Mm -hmm. Very, very inefficient. Mm. They have trained dogs to be able to sniff where the oil is. So you can save an enormous amount of money mm -hmm. and you can save an enormous amount of time and you can be much more accurate than walking along with lines of people with sticks because you can't see oil. As soon as it hits the shore, boom, it goes under the surface. Mm -hmm. So you don't know whether it's there or not to be cleaned up. This makes that a lot more efficient. So the following video that I'm gonna show you is compliments of pumps and pipes. I would recommend you turn your volume up 
And if you had have fed, fed, blah, blah, if you have headphones, I know it's been a bad day. If you have headphones, I haven't even started drinking yet. I would recommend that you, I probably so. I would use them for the best experience because this is a really cool video. And can you play it from there? I'll switch it over to it. There it goes. And this city, and this state, and this region will share greatly in this growth. What was once the furthest outpost on the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space. But this city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. Now, if that video doesn't excite you, we needed to turn it up louder in here, but that's okay. Um, but hopefully you had, you know, you can always rewatch it at home. I strongly recommend you turn the sound up as loud as you can, because it's a great video. And again, my thanks, very much thanks to uh, Dr. Lumsden, Steve Igo, Pumps and Pipes, of course, uh, also uh, uh, Debbie uh, for allowing us to use their slides, but, uh, and, uh, and Terry, of course, for his contribution. This was taken at the 2019 conference, Texas mm -hmm. Heart Institute. You can see that it was during the 50th anniversary of the first lunar landing, which you saw represented in that video that we just got through seeing. And this was their graduates from that year. They're out there in the field now working, uh, but hopefully they, and of course, any of you guys out there, gals out there that may be either recently graduated, new in your careers, I'm not sure what, uh, but you know, I've, I've got over 40 years of experience, Tammy over 20 years of experience. You're looking here at over 60 years of perfusion experience really at the end of the day, but it's a great job. It's a great profession. It's a great, wonderful career. It's everything you can imagine. And go ahead back to that picture if you would. But these guys here and you guys out there, um, can we put that picture? Thank you. Um, I would like for you all to be the next group of educators, communicators, collaborators, and innovators, because we really need all of you guys. And this was a really nice looking group. These were mm -hmm. great people. I know I met the new class. They seem like great. Um, I think our profession has a, uh, a, a very bright future, mm -hmm. but we need more people like this and could continue to do things that matter in our profession. So. There's my lecture. Uh, Tammy, you have any comments or questions? Or anybody else out there? We could open the phone lines if you'd like. No, no comments, no questions. Was it at least good? It was. <laughs> that hurts. It was thorough, it was good. Okay, good. Well, yeah. um, we could open the phone lines. We could discuss it for a second, I guess. Yeah. Um, a lot's happened in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I could tell a story about the lunar landing. If you've never been to the Kennedy Space Center, I had the opportunity, actually, I watched Apollo 13 launch from the pad, and I also watched Space Shuttle Endeavor 
launch from the pad. Wow. Um, those are incredible. Watching a rocket launch is really incredible. Um, but if you go to the Kennedy Space Center and you go to you know the museum area where they have everything about that first lunar landing with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and there's some great stories about that um, that they can tell. The felt tip pen is one that's like like incredible. Um, that uh, you, you got to look it up because it's a great story. But I'll tell you this much: you listen to Neil Armstrong talking, and it's just kind of like he's driving to the 7-Eleven. And he recognizes that the computer program of the lunar lander is taking him into a boulder field, which is going to result in them crashing. They're not going to survive this. So with a minute of fuel remaining, one minute, he disengages the computer programming and starts flying the Eagle over the lunar surface, or surface, I'm sorry, manually, and finds a more suitable landing spot and lands with 28 seconds of fuel remaining. And you would think that he was just ordering a cheeseburger, just as flat and calm, calm and, 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 matter of fact as one could be mm. impressive impressive people and what they were able to do mm -hmm. and accomplish but you know you think about it you know the heart surgery think about dr lily high doing cross circulation mm. one of the few procedures that you could have a 200 percent mortality rate mm. both the parent and the child mm -hmm. i don't know very many procedures where you could have a 200 percent mortality i guess uh Transplant. liver Maybe transplant, transplant or something or like that yeah. liver or a kidney i guess kidney but there's very few mm. very few and that procedure cross circulation you think about it i mean whoo i mean a part of a liver you know yeah anything can happen you know one of your kidneys yeah anything can happen i don't think it rises quite to the level of cross no. circulation and all of that they went through to do that then think about dr mustard you know up in canada you know dr mustard he was an orthopedic surgeon became a heart surgeon Okay, has, has a procedure named after for both orthopedics and heart surgery. The mustard procedure, of mm -hmm. course, right, for pediatrics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but he took monkey lungs and put them in a glass flask and pumped the patient's blood through them and ventilated the patient with a, with a, with a ventilator mm -hmm. to oxygen. That was his oxygenator. It's incredible. Could you imagine today? You know, maybe somebody like, you know, I mean, some surgeon coming in and say, Tammy, I think today what we're going to do is we're going to use monkey lungs as the uh, as the oxygenator. You know, what would you say? It'd be an interesting day. Uh -huh. Is that what you would say? I might call for backup. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, too. OK, if nobody's going to call in, I don't see any. Is anybody see any questions on Facebook? Of course, Magic's not here. Why am I not surprised? Yeah, he's outside smoking. We don't promote smoking. No, but magic does it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? There he is. He came back after his cigarette break. Any it's questions on face? Any questions on the Facebook or FaceTime and the Twitter? If not, we're going to go to a break. 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 Okay, we're going to go for a ten-minute break. We'll see you right back. Ten minutes. Check out our ads. Make sure you check out our sponsors. We need them, please. We need clicks, 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 clicks. And don't forget, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Okay, it's like voting. Vote early, vote often. Subscribe as many times as you can. Thank you very much. We'll see you in 10 minutes. The Point of Care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedures, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, 
then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we're about hospital-wide. I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress.
Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. Love the best one. Hey everyone, how are you? Welcome back to the program. Okay, so now we're going to talk about. I hope you really enjoyed that uh, presentation. I I I had such a good time putting it together. I really did, and uh, truly enjoyed it. Um, so I hope you all did too, and you get to go back and listen to it. Um, with that said, we're going to talk now about perfusion scope of practice. Mm -hmm. That's something you know a little bit about, I think. So I'm going to put up first 
This is from the AMSECT website. Mm -hmm. And this is the scope of practice for perfusion. And I'd like to go over it, if I could, with each one and discuss with you maybe your thoughts. Some are going to be sort of simple, mm -hmm. like no-brainer. Others may be a little iffy. You know, I'm not really sure. But let's explore it if we can. Okay. Um, first, uh, it says a fully licensed perfusionist may perform those functions and services which are necessary for the support, treatment, measurement, or supplementation of a patient's cardiovascular, circulatory, or respiratory systems or other organs, or any combination of those organs or systems, or which ensure the safe management of the patient's physiological functions through the monitoring and, and analysis of those bodily systems. So, going down, to the functions and services which may properly be performed by a fully licensed perfusionist include, but are not necessarily limited to the following. So I want to explore that first. Okay. The functions and services which may properly be performed by a fully licensed perfusionist include. Now, what does that mean? That, that may properly be performed. What does that mean? Does that mean that only a properly, that a, that, a, that a fully licensed perfusionist can properly perform these things? What does that mean? Well, I think it means that the perfusion education that we have mm -hmm. should given us the knowledge to be able to perform these tasks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it necessarily means that only a perfusion could perfusionist could perform it well. We've seen many of our jobs that we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. being performed by people who are not perfusionists, and some of them are doing it quite well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. What do, what do we uh, what do we got going on there? Oh oh, you're just doing that. Oh okay, I thought it was online. Okay, um, okay, so let's look. Use of extracorporeal circulation and associated therapeutic or diagnostic technologies. Well, I'm assuming that means running the pump mm -hmm. or the ECMO. I guess mm -hmm. it would mean either of those. Use of long-term cardiopulmonary support techniques, including extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO as associated therapeutic and or diagnostic technologies. Mm -hmm. Just agree, just that sounds good to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trained I, for all of that. Yes, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that statement because that previous one, but we'll talk about it in the context of licensure. So just remember about it and then we'll kind of circle back to mm -hmm. it, okay? Um, use or performance of counter pulsation. I'm assuming that's the balloon pump. Yeah, that's what I would think. Okay. And then let's go down the list to the next thing. Um, use of ventricular assist device, use or performance of, of VADs, mm -hmm. auto transfusion, mm -hmm. blood conservation techniques. Now, I will talk about that just for a second. I don't like the term blood conservation. Yeah, you've said that before. I've always disliked it. I think transfusion management is a better word to use because when you say blood conservation, what does that really mean? Well, I think you're right. You've told me this before that that sounds like you're saving it up for something more important or special. Whereas if you're talking about um, conserving, conserving is saving for something. Yes. And what's the term you like again? Transfusion management. Yeah, transfusion management sounds mm -hmm. like you're employing some sort of um, decision tree as to when it's appropriate to transfuse. Yeah, I think that just makes more sense. I just have never liked that term. Um, use or performance of myocardial preservation. I'm assuming that means cardioplegia. Yeah. Or I guess it could mean also for organ preservation techniques uh, for, uh, for transplants. Yeah. You know, um, with the performance procedures involving cardiopulmonary bypass, okay. Use and or performance of extracorporeal life support services or techniques, ECLS. Yeah. I guess that's what yeah. they're referring to there. Use or performance of isolated limb perfusion. Mm -hmm. Use or performance of techniques involving, here we are, blood management. Now that's good. 
advanced life support and other related functions. Um, I kind of like the way that's couched. Mm -hmm. Administration of pharmacological and therapeutic agents through the extraporeal circuit or through an intravenous line pursuant to an order from duly licensed physician. Now, this gets real sticky. Mm -hmm. We're not licensed in any state unless you're a registered nurse to give medications. To do that. Right. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Is it's within our scope of practice according to this. I'm not sure that what makes this that authority. I'm assuming that it is, you know, it's it is our national organization and they're suggesting, I guess, but we have state licensure which is going to govern that mm -hmm. and is also going to uh, supersede it. Mm -hmm. So what's your view on that? And have you ever been confronted with that as an issue? In fact, I know you were. You were just recently confronted with it when you were doing an ECMO transport and everybody abandoned you and you had no nurse or physician on the ambulance. Correct. What did you do? Well, we didn't have to give any medication. <laughs> we just had, I just had to support the pump. I did have a paramedic there. Mm -hmm. who is licensed to give medications. Some. Some. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. I'm, I'm glad the ride went well. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Did they have, like, did they have eye meds and various different drugs running? Yes. So, really, there should have been a nurse on board, mm -hmm. a registered, a critical care level registered nurse, mm -hmm. I think. I've traveled many times without a nurse. It's always preferable to have a nurse. You have. Mm -hmm. So that's not something you have never, that, that, for me, that's a first. Yeah, I've definitely done that. I before. was like, what? Uh, you know, when I heard it, I was just a little bit taken aback. I always ask for a nurse. Mm -hmm. They don't always provide one. And a lot of times it's, I think it's more just the inconvenience. It's happening at shift change. Someone doesn't want to go. They're not going to, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's exciting stuff. Why would you not want to do it? Should we require it? Should we say, which I'm perfectly comfortable doing, mm -hmm. we're not leaving without a critical care level registered nurse on, this, on board this ambulance? Well, the one that had happened to me, I had, I happened to have, most recently, I happened to have a very high level EMS team there mm -hmm. that this was what they they did they were called in because it was so like in, fire department level stuff yes I didn't have uh, you know I didn't have your normal very skilled I'm sure EMS team this was their specialty team I actually had three paramedics in the back with mm -hmm. me plus the driver not your front. usual nursing home transport team nope mm -hmm. So I, I felt very comfortable, although still, we had room for a nurse. Yes. The nurse didn't want to come. But my question still remains. Yeah. I know what I would do. Hmm. Hold on, I'm thinking about sneezing, but I don't want to because that would be like very bad COVID-wise. It would, where's your mask? <laughs> Sneeze that way. Mm -hmm. I will, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would run. <laughs> um, but my question still remains. And I can tell you what I would do, mm -hmm. which was I would not go. Do you think that should be a requirement for any perfusionist to say, everybody time out, mm -hmm. we need a critical care nurse on board this ambulance or we're not going anywhere? I don't think it's an unreasonable request and I don't think it would be unreasonable to make that a part of a procedure for transport. A policy, right. so to speak. Yeah. Our policy, mm -hmm. a perfusionist's policy. Right. Because if something does happen, um, I feel like we're not protected mm -hmm. legally. If we do have to administer something because the patient, you know, something happens, mm -hmm. um, how do we justify that? No, you can't. Right. And then if you didn't do it, if you didn't require it, and you're sitting there in the courtroom and they're asking you, well, you knew you couldn't do this, so why did you leave without somebody mm -hmm. in there? Do you think that'd be a question that might be asked 
And do you think that would go unfavorably towards us if that were the question that was asked of us in a in a in a in a well, court of law? Well, if the perfusionist administered drugs, didn't administer anything, but the patient needed something. Hmm. Well, I guess it goes to. I think that. I think it could be the perfusionist could get in trouble for that, but I do think it goes back to your transport doctor. Mm Mm-hmm. If anybody, that's true. If anybody has any thoughts on this, call in or or text in or chat in or whatever. I'm kind of curious to see what you all think. Particular doctor, while we're performing our ECMO monitoring. Yes, agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to the next thing. Um. I said, Lim, use or performance of physio, oh, that's easy, use or performance of central, ah, hypo or hyperthermia, mm-hmm. man. Okay, so, 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 you know, they do therapeutic hypothermia now with, you know, various jackets that they put on. Almost no one does it extracorporeally. No one puts a Maherker catheter in, uses a cardioplegia heat exchanger, runs it like you would just a a closed loop system, I think you would be highly efficient at cooling the patient down and have a more controlled temperature um, uh, drop in maintenance. But currently they just use those cooling jackets. Mm -hmm. I've seen one where they put the patient and submerge them in ice Mm -hmm. water and take them out and then blow fans and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but therapeutic hypothermia is very common now. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you seeing it done and are you seeing good outcomes and do you think an extracorporeal methodology would make more sense? I know I'm getting off topic, but I'm curious. Getting off topic, you? Yeah, no way. Um, yeah, I know. Um, actually, I don't have a lot of experience with um, that usage other than when we're you know, protecting a patient uh, who possibly has had a brain injury on ECMO. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with temperature control like that. I did do very early on in my career a little isolated limb perfusion. And so, of course, we did hyperthermia, extreme hyperthermia. Um, What's extreme? How high is extreme? 43. Okay. So 43 centigrade. That's about 107, somewhere around there. Yeah. And in fact, at the time, the the heater, because it wasn't a cooler at all, Mm -hmm. that was used I remember being told they don't even make these anymore to go this hot, so you have to be very gentle with it because mm-hmm. we need it to, we need it to last. Mm-hmm. To use the, to do it on these procedures. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. What did you see when you did that? Did you see? Was there any systemic effect? No. No. It was no. all just. Yeah, a tourniquet up and um, no, no, mm-hmm. s- no real systemic effect. It, they were pretty interesting, actually. I would have liked to continue doing that sort of thing. Uh, mm-hmm just for the sheer novelty of mm-hmm. thinking of that idea and mm-hmm. um, being able to isolate the body in mm-hmm. such a way that you could give those really high doses mm-hmm. of the chemotherapy. It's pretty interesting. Well, that was the whole idea of, uh, what was the guy's name? Was it Kali? Kali's Cocktail, I think what it was mm. called, where they would he would give people with cancer an infection Mm. Um, so that they would get a fever Mm -hmm. because they recognize that cancer cells don't do well with high temperature. Right. Um, But, uh, and you know, it had mixed, I think there's mixed results, mixed outcomes associated with it. But I think, I think temperature alone, I don't think you can keep the temperature high enough, um, long enough for it to be all that, because it just breaks down so much. You get denaturization, you get apoptosis. Um, there's a lot of bad things that happen um, to the tissue. Systemically, it would be very, 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 I've tried it um, back in the old days of uh, HIV. Mm. Um, this was in the, in the 80s, and we were doing systemic hyperthermia oh. at uh, 43 degrees. Wow. And, uh, How were you for, protecting the brain? Uh, we weren't, um, but, you know, the, the, the outcomes were clearly you know now it did the Kaposi's kind of resolved but we killed all the people all mm-hmm. the patients yeah but there were of course you know these were HIV positive AIDS patients that were you know not going to survive back they then they were there was trying nothing. to do anything they could to yeah we know. were experimenting on people yeah yeah well and the people probably knew their outcome and yes it wasn't going to be yes long but we were anyway. doing it veno arterial mm. um, I think veno venous would have made a lot more sense 
but uh, with Vino Arturo, it was very interesting to see how dramatically hyperdynamic uh, the heart became really? at that temperature. Really impressive, very impressive. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, moving on from there. Hey, Jeff, uh, yes. You want to let Dave Oh. Oh. I don't think anybody at home watched that video. Oh, why didn't you why didn't you tell me? Because you were messing with it and then you quit. Oh. Well I don't even know where I I don't even know where I am. Can you see? I I can see. Yeah, okay. Well there it here it is. Yeah, thanks. Um let's see. Yeah, I don't know where we are either. Okay, so we are at um Let's see, isolated limb, we went through that. Here, uh, therapeutic, it's 4.19 to 4.110 yeah, is where we there just we finished. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, okay, so therapeutic hypo, hyperthermia, intravascular membrane oxygenation, uh, non-clinical responsibilities now, documentation, education, administration responsibilities, quality control, regulatory. Well, I don't want to get into all of this. I think it's interesting that down here, critical evaluation of published research. You know, I can get on that topic. You know what? I'll get a get on that topic because you know, I just went through this. I think you skipped over a bunch of important stuff, though. Oh, you did? Do? Yeah. Okay, well, here. Well, Here's the controller. I think that, you do it. Well, just, I think briefly, we can't just scroll past all of these. I don't know how to scroll up. I, oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the non-clinical responsibilities, because especially Here, if just you click it. okay, thanks. There. Especially if you're uh, employed by a hospital, mm -hmm. this is going to be a lot of your job. It's important to understand mm -hmm. uh, your expectations for this, um, because you're regulated, and you need to understand that you are going to be doing these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. the quality control. I mean, we even see that as you know clinicians not hospital employed it's huge it's a huge responsibility mm -hmm. and um, it's something you got to get on board with mm -hmm. and I think also too uh, making sure that you are a part of the education we educate people who aren't in our field all the time so mm -hmm. that we're able to perform as a cohesive team mm -hmm. during procedures I mean I think that's a very good point I agree with you 100% I miss the days when we would go on pump and my perfusion record said the time we went on and then it said the time we went off and then it had an outcome, lived or died. That was your perfusion record? That was record? my perfusion record when I first started. Oh my gosh. That was it. Have you ever seen my charting? Yes, it is impressive. <laughs> it is impressive. I hate charting. I hate regulatory compliance. I hate it, but I realize how important it is. The problem is, I'm the worst person in the world to talk about it because I hate it so much. So that's why I want you to take well, take over this section. I think I think charting can be a distraction. I am not for over charting, whatever that may be to you. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to document the flow of the case, mm -hmm. uh, not just for you know bad outcomes that maybe might be reviewed later in court and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important way to um, be able to do peer reviews, mm -hmm. be able to train your mind as to the things that might be pertinent to happen in a certain order, because many cases go, you know, this first, this next, and so on and so on. And if you're constantly charting, you're training your brain that those are the steps and how those occur. Mm -hmm. That works for you. That works for you. I'm over, all over the map. You have worked with me, have you not? I have. Okay. I, I, we, do, we have the same end result, but we definitely get there a different way. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Most recently, I did all the charting, didn't I? Yeah, well, I, I, and yes, and you were kind enough to do that because had I had to do that, it would have not been It good. was pretty busy. It, well, yes, I would have had to do it later. I would have just well, sat and down. Well, sometimes and, you have to do it later. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely been guilty of writing down the most important things on my leg, you know, on my mm -hmm. scrub, because you can't get away to do whatever. But mm -hmm. I think 
I think charting is important. Um, I think quality control is important, and I think education of members outside our team are important. Mm -hmm. You know, even things that aren't necessarily their scope of practice, but you know, training ICU personnel to mm -hmm. be familiar with the ECMO machine or where supplies are kept, because I think it helps everyone in an emergency situation. Absolutely. You know, just like it's it's our responsibility to be able to help in the OR in a non-emergent situation because sometimes people are busy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt to know or how to- Or even in an emergency. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't make any difference. It doesn't hurt to know how to do a few things that are outside your regular responsibilities. Yes. You know, even just learning a few sutures and where they're located, it could be extremely helpful. Well, you know, God, you bring up so many good points. Um, and again, this is gonna be going off topic. But how many times do I tell people, you know, when I'm doing a case, and I think you too, I can look and I can see if it's a shiny blue suture mm -hmm. and it's real thin, I know he's on a distal. Mm -hmm. I can tell whether if it's a valve, you know, you know, they go blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. I can count them up and know pretty much where they're at in terms of putting the sutures in or when they're tying the knots and when they've forgotten to tell me to rewarm. Or just, or, um, or key words, you know, like certain places use certain things. I used to have my trigger words at my old place, you know, with surgeons that I'd worked with for years. Mm -hmm. And that in the beginning I wrote down, when he asked for 7-0, that's the mammary, and that means I need to warm. Because I had plenty of surgeons that don't really want to be bothered with that. They were very routine. Yep. And so you could count on that. So I wrote that down in the beginning until that was a cue for me. I could be doing a million other things, but as soon as he asked for a 7-0, oh, mm -hmm. it's time to warm. Mm -hmm. You know, or we're doing a valve and they ask for the core knot. Oh, time to warm. Yep. You know? So. Yep. Core knot certainly shaves a lot of time off. Yeah. So what 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 do you think is the perfusionist scope of practice? I mean, we just looked at all of that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that? encompasses it is there anything else below it i can't really tell oh, i don't think see, so there see. was the and you might want to scroll so people can see it you know and i'm sorry yeah, that see. i didn't realize that wasn't working yeah hold on let's go at the top here where i'm technologically challenged yeah just use here look use two fingers and you do it like there that we go. Okay. see how that works yeah, yeah. okay so let's I'll, I'll go up there you tell me to the, scroll yeah just go to the top and just scroll slowly so people mm -hmm. can look through so i think as best you as can be done, because things are always changing, I suppose. I think all the clinical stuff is pretty well covered. And I think, I don't know that you touched on this, but I, I did notice that it was stated to be a living document. So I'm sure it's being modified whenever new technologies or responsibilities that perfusionists regularly perform are mm -hmm. coming up and being added. But um, the non-clinical, I, I think that has grown a lot, even just in my career mm-hmm that's right here yeah it yeah right there. it's and I, I also think that you know it's not just a requirement to stay certified but mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to read literature to see what's mm -hmm. going on not just mm -hmm. because we have to get the C, uh, the CEUs but just so you can stay knowledgeable absolutely you bring up that's another really good point in fact, that brings up my point of the last thing, critical evaluation of published research. Okay, I brought you full That's, circle. You brought me full circle. Good. Okay. We're not supposed Social, to touch. No, so, no, you can knuckles. No, I think it's elbows. Because okay. knuckles go to your face. Okay. Elbows don't. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I was going to say because I'll just get in trouble. Yeah. No, don't no say I'm it. not going to say it. So we just went through this where, and I think this is very exciting, we're going to be doing, to, and I'm, it's, I, the website, the Perf Web website is going to need a little bit, just another couple of days. I'm working on it. It's going to be great. It's going to have everything that you need on there. But we were just going to do Tammy Sparacino's Journal Club. Yep. A critical review of... Timely articles. Timely articles. Mm -hmm. And do it here live where people could participate. People could call in. People could chat in. People could listen to us discuss this. And it gets denied category one CEU. Here it is in our scope of practice. Mm. It shouldn't have been denied as far as I'm concerned. So we're still going to do it. Mm -hmm. We're still going to have Tammy Sparacino's Journal Club, only it's going to be shortened, but it's going to include after that 
an actual discussion roundtable about the topic mm -hmm. that the journal article was about because you bring up such an important point. We have to be learning all the time. As long as I've been doing this, and I know as long as you've been doing this, and I know I've been doing this. I mean, I've been, how long have you been doing this? 20 years, right? 20 Almost years? 20. Almost 20 years, and me, 42 years. That's a long time. That's two lifetimes. You probably feel after 20 years that that's a career. Yeah. I've got a career plus a career, mm -hmm. and I still learn stuff. Well, it's, I still enjoy it. We're in a field that's very evolving. Medicine evolves. Constantly and our jobs evolve our responsibilities evolve mm -hmm. and the more adaptable we are the more viable we stay yes how many absolutely. times have you heard i mean i've heard it many times already over that perfusion is no more and it's going to be this oh, I've and that been and listening the other to it for 40 years but i think the reason why that hasn't happened is we've adapted we've evolved we've found other ways to use our education and our skills to make us valuable when perhaps surgeries are down or there looks like there's going to be a different direction in you know cardiothoracic uh, surgery absolutely and, and it seems to always come full circle you know back but i think if we were stagnant if we were rigid if we said i was trained to do you know uh, x yes run the bump right mm -hmm. i then i think it goes back to that whole uh what was the term the pump monkey yes Absolutely. And we're not that. Absolutely. May have started out as something that was going to be very, um, you know, small scope of our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the, the people who have come before us have done a great deal to make sure that they've expanded the education, expanded the opportunity for this to be a very viable profession. Agree with you 100%. In fact, there was a really neat cartoon that I stole that had to do with cardiac surgeons and then I, I, I changed it for perfusionists and it basically was a bunch of dinosaur perfusionists on a bus and the front of it that said the destination was extinction. <laughs> you know, so we don't want to be on no. the bus to extinction, but right. we I mean we easily could be. So can you throw up the other PDF uh, with the uh, or the other thing I sent you? with the um, state licensure, because I think this was very interesting. Now, this is Massachusetts. Now, this time we'll, we'll, hand, we'll, we'll do it. I got it. I, I realized what I had done wrong. So here is the state of Massachusetts, um, their uh, 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 scope of practice. And it's really very similar to, and if you just read it, you can see that it's very, very, very similar, basically taken from I think the uh, the AMSECT uh, scope of practice, but it brings up a couple of issues. Okay. And that is regarding state licensure. So there you go. You, can, you guys can read this on your own and see what's in it. I'll just and go through it And it's probably similar to many time. other states. Yes, I mean, I think so. I just picked Massachusetts just because it was convenient online. It was easy. I found it very easily mm -hmm. and put it up there. I think that's just the point. But state as far as i'm concerned licensure supersedes anything amsec says even if they use amsec as guidance that's what i believe and then what was the point of state licensure why is every state not a licensed state why is it so lim why are so few states doing licensure and has licensure really been worth it those are all my questions and i'm coming I to you for some, answers i have some opinions on that well let me hear them okay so when i first got out and people were, you know, looking to get jobs at different places. I remember one of the benefits, supposedly, of going to a state with, uh, that had state licensure. Mm -hmm. And Texas was one of those states, and I wanted to stay in Texas, so I thought this was a great benefit, was that it was going to protect my job responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Because what's outlined in a state licensure to be a, a perfusionist as a clinician, what they are responsible for. And uh, with not being a profession that has, you know, the weight of like a medical degree or a PhD or- Nursing. Know, right. There's 3.4 million nurses. The, right. The, the and they're a nurses, powerful force. The nurses, are so, yeah, when you have that in my numbers. Yeah. We have 4,300. Right. And so being a smaller number, not having, you know, these uh, professional degrees with it, you want to make sure that your time and efforts and training, I mean, perfusion 
school wasn't you know free mm -hmm. you put a big investment in it you want to make sure it's going to be a good career anyway i thought that that was something that was going to really be uh you know uh, an advocate for saving my uh people mm -hmm. being on the job trained to do my job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have not seen that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've seen the opposite of that here. And part of that is maybe the unique environment that the Texas Medical Center is. You know, it's a very busy um, medical center, lots of cardiac procedures going on with lots mm -hmm. of devices and things that there's simply just not enough of us to be able to handle, honestly. Yes. Yes. But I do see where that could be a problem if all of a sudden, you know, hospitals just decided that they don't need a professional person to do this. We can train people who have uh, less education and therefore probably less uh, salary demands mm -hmm. to be able to do a job that mm -hmm. we have gone to, you know, uh, school to do. Mm -hmm. Very good points. I showed you that picture of the robot running the robot mm -hmm. okay robonaut yeah um and that's a real thing yeah. I mean, they, they need that you know he's he is somewhat impervious to um to uh, uh the uh, radiation from space so he's very good for doing space blocks oh, and then he can be controlled by the person who's wearing a certain suit that's linked to it so that when he moves it moves mm -hmm. And that's the whole kind of idea of Robonaut is yeah. that a person can make him do what they need it to do without having the exposure right. of the harsh environment. Uh, but, uh, but with that said, um, look at what happened with this COVID-19 crisis. And, you know, it was surprising to me that we saw so little ECMO. Yeah, it's but puzzling. It is. It, it very much I mean, is. I'm thankful, I suppose. Me too. You know, that means less people hopefully being that critical, but it was or very surprising. being suitable for ECMO. Well, perhaps that too. You know, mm -hmm. not everyone is suitable for ECMO. If you have all these comorbidities or you're yeah. 88 years old, you're probably not really a candidate. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem there. Because, of course, tomorrow, I mean, not tomorrow, Saturday, an incredible program. Oh. We're going to actually have the first... COVID-19 associated ECMO patient in Houston, mm -hmm. all of Houston. I mean, this whole area, we were the absolute first. And he is gonna be here, right here in this studio. The patient is the gonna patient, be The patient, yes. Um, it's phenomenal. He's a law enforcement officer, he's back at work, and he's gonna talk about what that experience of getting the disease, how he felt, what led him to eventually, what to whatever point he remembers, and then yeah. how, what did he remember what does he remember from the actual hospital stay? Mm -hmm. Did he? Did he? Did he? Does he have any recollection of being on ECMO or or not? I'm really not sure. It's going to be a very interesting interview. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited about the program the on human, Saturday. I love the human aspect of it. Yeah, it's going to be a very good program Saturday. It's going to be. I mean, the fact we have eight people, so we have too many. It's too 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 many people for the desk. So we're going to have to do this in shifts somehow. I'll probably get my podium over there, and they'll probably stick me outside. But, uh, but, you know, it's gonna be a lot of people and it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, however, I, I, do have a, I do have some angst when it comes to state licensure as well. I don't think it did what we thought, but ECMO is really, I think, the, uh, the pivot point, you know? Well, and at what I, just to, before you switch gears here, those were all my initial, you know, expectations and then disappointments. And I'm not sure what, state licensure does for me i mean i'm really uh, i don't know that it does anything maybe it costs it, you money yeah it costs money i mean maybe there are things that and i'm time. not i'm not considering uh because i mean i haven't fully explored that but I've, I've changed my position on why i would think that those kind of concerns would be necessary mm -hmm. well i'm going to bring up two things okay the first one um is going to be what I just mentioned, which is the ECMO issue. Mm -hmm. uh, my concern, and I'll tell you, because the second story that I'm gonna tell you is going to, I think, put to rest this idea. Now, unless industry comes up with an automated cardiopulmonary bypass system, and knowing heart surgery the way I do, I don't even know that that's really possible. I don't think it's affordable. I think the cost of automation 
will exceed the cost of us and the way we're currently doing mm -hmm. it. So that's what's going to hold that back, at least for, I think, my lifetime, probably your lifetime, and anybody that's already graduated lifetime. So I, I think that right now that's not going to happen because it's just going to be way too expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many variabilities in cardiac surgery. So many things can happen. Um, but I think with ECMO, I think that really it comes down to if, if this COVID-19 had been high ECMO utilization, I just simply do not think we have enough perfusionists to do it. And I feel like, you know, we're going to have to accept that some people can perform certain extra, in fact, they're doing it now. There's nurse ECMO specialists, there's respiratory ECMO specialists, there's ECMO specialists that have almost no training at all. My argument with it isn't that, I mean, I don't wanna give away our jobs. I really don't. I mean, if that's what anybody thinks about my position on this, they're wrong, but I have to be a pragmatist. You have to recognize that we simply don't have enough people and we still have to take care of these patients. And my argument is let us oversee it. Let us control it. Let us be the ones that manage it so that we keep involved in it. Because if we don't, what I think is going to happen, if we don't accept this, if we don't move in that direction, something is going to happen somewhere. And they're going to say, we simply don't need you for ECMO. We're closing our unit. You go do your heart surgery and we'll take care of the ECMO. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing, state licensure does not stop that from happening. Yep. Nothing will stop, the AMSEC certainly can't stop that from happening. Nobody can stop that from happening. And my view is, instead of fighting it and saying, no, that's a perfusion responsibility. No, that's a perfusion responsibility. I mean, come on. You know, you do an ECMO shift, you know, as well as I do. When you're on cruise control, we don't really have to be right there at the bedside. Right. Now, anything can happen. I recognize sure. that. The number of times anything actually happens once you're settled and everything's kind of under control is extremely rare and remote. And there's things that can happen even if I am standing there, the outcome will be the same as if I was at home sleeping. And we both, we all know that too. So I think we need to be more pragmatic about this as an issue. In regards to running the pump in the operating room, look, I have seen this happen time and time again, where you go to a place, maybe you're not that familiar, or you, you, you're new there, and you hear the people talk, you go, oh, must be nice, you know, well, you got a great job, you make all that money, and you're out by noon with no balloon on the golf course, and you know, blah, 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 blah. Everybody thinks, oh my God, the perfusionists, they're overpaid, they're not worth the money, they're, look at what they do, they barely do anything, you know, you need to start mopping the floors, transporting patients, you need to start doing all these things. And then you get the case in the middle of the night and it all is going to hell in a handbasket and no one is saying a word. No one is coming over there saying, oh, let me do this. You don't, you don't need to be here. I can handle this. That's when, that's what we're paid for. That's we're right. not paid for a routine two vessel on or off pump cabbage. We're paid for when, and I'll explain what happened during this procedure. I won't say where, I don't say when, but you were with me. Mm -hmm. And we were on a closed system. We had to emergently put this patient on VA ECMO. And uh, inexplicably, of course, because this is a now big operation, there's a whole lot happening all at the mm -hmm. same time. We're transitioning from pump to this. And it is very busy, very hectic, very crazy. And we're on full mechanical circulatory support with a closed system. And the venous line ends up getting pulled out enough to where all the holes were exposed or enough of them to whew, deep prime the system. And the patient's very unstable, cannot tolerate. Is ECMO dependent, yeah. circulatory support dependent. Absolutely. And we were able to take that circumstance and not have to bother anyone else. And we bam, 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 got it fixed, got back on circulatory support, well within a time frame to be neuroprotective. I mean, we're talking about what, maybe 
30 to 45 seconds, maybe 60 seconds tops. A minute at the um, most. And uh, we're able to do it. But that's the experience. And that's when everyone who saw what happened, who may have thought to themselves, oh, these perfusionists have it made, are thinking to themselves, I'm glad I don't have that job. Right. Because just like Calvin Hughes, who was working for General Motors as an engineer, who was the first perfusionist for the for the dodrill heart pump mm -hmm. that went to med school that became a psychiatrist, there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Because this business will either, first of all, you gotta be crazy to get in it, and it'll drive you crazier the longer you stay in it. Because this is not for the faint of heart. What we do is so incredibly specialized and nobody really completely understands just, it. Yeah, I just had this conversation with a friend who is a new friend, so not really familiar with my job. And she says, you know, she was saying something like, wow, that, that sounds, you know, pretty great. You know, you're, you have a flexible kind of schedule and all these kinds of things. And I said, yeah. Well, it's because you work for AGT. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and we're always accepting applications, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. And, um, but then I started explaining some of the intricacies of not even what we do in the OR. This was kind of not even mm -hmm. about that. It was just about the level of commitment and responsibility and adaptability that is what is going to make either you successful or whether you're successful or not, but at least a, a level of, uh, I guess, normalcy and happiness in this kind of job. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, well, you know, we have to take on call and, you know, and sometimes on call is not even when you're not on call because if you've got more patients to take care of and it's, you know, in the evening, the weekend, after after hours, you're not going to not do the case because you're not on call, you know? And I was talking about, I always have my phone kind of around because things can happen and yep. you wanna be available for your colleagues, you know, whether it's a question or they need some help or whatever, that's the level that is different, I think, for us, that protects us from maybe some other uh, jobs that we're allowing other people to do. And I'm certainly not speaking to, you know, ECMO specialists. Those are usually very highly trained type of medical professionals who are already used to that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even when I was in perfusion school, there was um, a team of people and lots of them were really smart people. Um, but they definitely had a, a lower level of training who were handling VADs and balloons and things like that. Mm -hmm. And many of them were doing an excellent job and that, in itself was something that I thought, mm, should I be worried about that? This person didn't even have to pay to be able to get this experience. Mm -hmm. And then now they, they've got a pretty uh, neat job in Texas Medical Center doing things that I thought I was being trained to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of times you're gonna find the level of commitment from someone who is performing a job and someone who is um, pursuing a profession. It's going to be completely was, different. And that was the word I was going to use is professionalism. Everything you described is what separates true professionals mm -hmm. from any other type of employee. And you and can I have you see at that. all levels yes. any kind of job. You can have someone that they have made this their profession. Yes. I mean, I can think of a hospital that we work at that there is a person there who serves the coffee and it is her profession and she is amazing and she takes that job seriously. Yes. It's not her job that she shows up to and you can see that. Yes. She so, loves what she does and she has pride and in what she's doing. And she does her doing. very best in yes. whatever it is she's and doing. And people so, respect her. Absolutely. And people respect you and people, re that's how you earn the respect of your colleagues and your coworkers, mm -hmm. um, or but your professional colleagues, and 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 the 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 healthcare family mm -hmm. as a whole, because it doesn't take one person. It doesn't just take a surgeon. No. It doesn't just take an anesthetist. It doesn't just take a perfusionist or a nurse. It takes that person that does that with the coffee, and everybody mm -hmm. needs to feel that they matter. But that all comes internally, in my view. Absolutely. You have to have pride and self-respect to want to do the best job that you can possibly do, which I think in perfusion, since we're referring to that here, 
is requires us to be involved, to take our profession seriously, to look and think outside the box, mm -hmm. to understand our scope of practice, but not limit ourselves to what was written in some document as what they propose to be your scope of practice. Well, Add to it. Right. I think that's, you have to have a starting point from somewhere. And I think Clearly. they were ex, ex, um, inclusive as they could be. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that there's probably many perfusionists out there doing things that are not on there that have become vital to how their practice runs. Absolutely. Agree with you 100%. You know? I truly do. I have enjoyed this conversation with you tremendously. Um, I think if it's okay with everybody, I think I'm gonna end a little early. I'm gonna suggest that everybody please check out our website, perfweb.us, after, um, and perfusioneducation.com. Make sure you get that right, perfusioneducation.com, okay? I get very, you know how I get very upset. Um, make sure when they, they go to the place they're that. trying to go to. Yes, that's yeah. what I'm trying to do. Perfusioneducation.com. Okay, it's very important. And perfweb.us, by Sunday, I'll have it tightened up, buttoned up, with a lot of neat, neat new stuff on it. Am I allowed to mention anything about the other thing that's coming out here pretty soon? Magic? Huh? Can I? Yeah. yeah. I you can? should. Okay, yeah. so, well... We are, I just want to let y'all know. An exciting we are, announcement. It is an exciting announcement. I probably shouldn't do this. I'm going to jinx myself. We've only been working on it for the past 20 years. Um, <laughs> but we're going to have a, uh, a really neat app coming out that is going to be a perfusion, ECMO, critical care nursing, uh, nurse practitioner, PA. It's going to be very streamlined. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have... Tested. Though, yeah, yeah, beta testing it now. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What is your opinion? It's awesome. Awesome. I like that. Awesome. awesome. And uh, I think you're all going to really enjoy it because it's going to have those. It's not overwhelmingly filled with It's not with an encyclopedia. Things. Right. No. It's a usable resource that you will be able to find what you need very quickly and get the information from it. I mean, that's yeah. what apps are supposed to do. Absolutely. And it's quick easy fast it's got all the, the the most common calculations that you would need some good nomograms on there with information on there in case you get confronted with an issue it even has one of the, the one of the neatest parts i won't i'm just going to give you a little teaser but if you're going to transport somebody and you need to know something now you can click a button and find out mm -hmm. and so that's a teaser you're not going to know what that means until you see it so uh so we'll see you on saturday it's been a pleasure, Tammy. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Always I'm looking forward. Yes, I'm looking so much forward to the Tammy Sparacino's uh, Journal Club. I've only been trying to get that this off the ground. Is for going to a be so much fun and so informative and uh, and great. And uh, we do have to restructure it, however, mm -hmm. because we do have to comply with the board requirements, which, you know, we, we may just wow to, them and they may change the requirements. They might. They mm -hmm. might decide that. Mm -hmm. But we're going to sort of maneuver around it so that you have category one CEU mm -hmm. and all of that kind of thing. Um, but the journal club portion of it will only be category three. But there's nothing I can do about that. That's just the way the system is. And uh, but I'll have all that on the website again. Look for it on. And don't forget to put Perf Web up there. Um, and don't forget to take a look at it on Sunday. We'll have it all buttoned up. Yes. Do you have a question? Comment. Comment? Well, go ahead. Re read it out to me. Oh. Oh, you sent it to me. Oh. Well, I mean, I have my phone on silent because if I don't, you get mad at me and yell at me. So hold on. Let me see. Let me see the comment. What is it? Attachment, one image. It says here, um, thanks for watching. Perfusion Live. Now, once the perfusionist has, this is from Adib Almadani. Ah, once the perfusion, hey, Adib. Once the perfusionist has correct training and education and has the privilege to give medications, then he can hold the patient alone as her case. The perfusionist always is creative. That's true. I agree with you 100%. Um, Paul De Gregorio, this is how I was taught 40 years ago. Well, Paul, welcome to the club. Okay. Although I love the cameras. Ah, you love the cameras. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Is that it? 
So Paul, thank you very much. We appreciate it. A deep thank you. Chris J. Cleveland, uh, Perfusion Education is live now. Yes, thank you so much. And not only is it live, it's fun, it's informative, it's relaxed, it's back and forth, it's, it's different opinions. Not everyone ever agrees with me, Tammy in particular. Um, and that's a good thing, I think, you know, having, being able to share thoughts and uh, to be able to see things from different perspectives is very important for us to Which grow as people. exactly why we welcome comments and would love phone calls. Yes, I know, nobody I know. ever I've likes to call. I've never met so many perfusionists that are so shy. Have you ever gone to a conference? We'll have microphones set up. And when we used to do the New Orleans conference, we'd have microphones in the audience and people would just shout their question from the back and not go to the microphone. Well, they just don't like, they get, they get mic fright. Yeah, they get, I mean, that happens to me too, but I think that a conference is a little more formal, even your conferences are a little more formal. Mm -hmm. I think this is very informal and no one is going to need to, you know, pre-write their question. They can mm -hmm. just call with a comment. Yes, and, and it's we're just not judgmental. Nope. We're pretty easy to get along with. And I've had people call from, um, uh, from, uh, from Saudi Arabia, that surgeon that called. Um, I've got a call with a uh, perfusionist. Well, she's a PhD, a physician or a doctor, a uh, PhD doctor um, in Thailand. And the, uh, also with her and the, their president of the Thailand Perfusion Society on Sunday. I'm going to be talking with her about doing some collaboration with them. I've got a, we've got a, made a new friend in Portugal that I need to get a hold of. We're going to schedule the uh, journal club and the lectures around the international schedule so that more people can be included mm -hmm. and it's not midnight or one o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. for everybody rest but also recognizing that here in the united states we have different time zones we're working with the canadians right now we got a lot of stuff going on with them so we're really doing a lot of outreach and you know we uh, we'd we, love to hear we want from you other to be people. a part of it yes we want you to be a part of it and uh we've made some great friends john ingram praveen mm -hmm. from up mm -hmm. in new york uh, Matt from over in Nashville. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've really come a long way in the few years that we've been doing this. It's been a lot of fun, but I couldn't have done it without you. I couldn't do it without all the, I couldn't do it without uh, people like you, you know, Stephanie, Rodell, mm -hmm. Nate, Patrick, well, um, and all, just, Dr. Matoyer, Dr. Badia. You're always inviting anyone. And I think that's what makes it great because different opinions, different fields, all of those things. Dr. Uh, Samir. Yeah. Or what about even uh, Tracy? Yeah, you know? Tracy Howith. Yeah. She was great. Yeah. And it, it, you know, she's, you wouldn't normally think that that would be something to have on our uh, perfusion program, but it was very enlightening. I think the information was great. It's a, I think so it's too. A, it's a collaboration. Precisely. Timely, outside of the box, looking in the other person's toolbox. And, uh, and getting opinions from different industries, I think makes us all better. Okay, I'm done, I'm out. See you on Saturday at zero dark 30, 7.45, I think we go live with the uh, advertisements and all that kind of stuff. Eight o'clock, the program starts. It's gonna be a big program. It's gonna be really neat. You don't wanna miss it. Um, I'll have this other stuff up on Sunday. Be looking for our app that's gonna be coming out. Um, just a lot of exciting stuff. Send me an email, give me a call, whatever you want to do, and I'll talk to you all on Saturday. Peace out. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. 
for venous femoral access, the Levanova Wrap Cannula features a dual-stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedures, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts turning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital wide. We, I think we'll be hospital wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, 
hotel, and meals out, this totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today.